Enthalpies of formation, that'll be the topic in this last lesson in a chapter on thermochemistry. Now, in the previous lesson, we went through how to calculate delta H of a reaction using Hess's law. When you're supplied with a bunch of reactions and their corresponding delta H values, and you need to flip them around and stuff like this and manipulate them, and that's the harder method. We're going to learn a much easier method for calculating the delta H of a reaction that's going to be a very plug and chug type thing. But you've got to be provided these delta H of formation values kind of in table form like this. But if you are provided with that, that's the much easier scenario. And what you're simply going to do is take the sum of all the delta H's formation of the products minus the sums of all the delta H's of the reactants. And it's pure plug and chug. Now, if this is your first time joining me, my name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is twofold. I hope to make science both understandable, but I also hope to make learning it enjoyable. This is my new high school chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications. You'll be notified every time I post another lesson. Okay, so as we said in the intro here, though, using enthalpies of formation to calculate delta H way easier than Hess's law. Technically, it is an application of Hess's law, but you're never going to realize that it is. Somebody defined these enthalpies of formation in such a way that it really just, just turned into a plug and chug scenario. Products minus reactants. So some of them and stuff like this. So in this case, we'll see how easy this is. So here we've got this lovely reaction, and I've provided you with the delta H information for all the reactants and products. And we're simply going to do products minus reactants. So in this case, we'll start with N2O. That's going to be 81.6. So here, delta H of the reaction is going to equal 81.6 kilojoules plus the value for NO2, which is 33.8 kilojoules. And that is all your products. And then we'll subtract out the reactants. And in this case, the M and the N here refer to the number of moles in the reaction. So when there are coefficients, you've got to multiply by that. And so in this case, we'll have to multiply NO's value by a 3. So 3 times 90.4. Cool. And in this case, we'll pull out that handy dandy calculator. And so in this case, 81.6 plus 33.8 minus 3 times 90.4. Cool, negative 155.8, and I lost a parentheses there, so... Cool, and that is the delta H of our reaction here. So little Rxn is our shorthand for reaction in chemistry. And if you notice, this is exactly the same reaction of one of the two applications of Hess's law we used. And we did that, it came out to negative 156 kilojoules. The only reason it's coming out a little more exact here is because I rounded some of the numbers on the application of Hess's law, whereas I didn't round these delta H's of formation quite as much. Cool, let's move on to the next one here. And again, I've provided you with a table of values. And at first glance, it, you might think that we haven't provi provided you with everything you need, but it turns out we actually have. So again, we'll do products minus reactants. So, and your first product is N2, and it's not on the table. So now the H2O is, and that's the two times the negative 242. But what to do about the missing N2? Well, it turns out we're going to define what these enthalpies of formation are in a little bit. So, but the way they're defined for any element in its standard state, it by definition will have an enthalpy of formation of zero. And we do expect you to remember that. So in this case, these are both elements. Now these are compounds. Compounds are never going to have a zero value, but if it's an element and it has to be in its standard state, notice like for N2, N2 is at one of the seven diatomics. Its standard state is diatomic and it is in the gaseous phase. If I said N2 liquid, it wouldn't be zero and I'd have to give you a number in the table. If I didn't make it diatomic, if I just said N gas, not N2 gas, but just N gas, I'd have to give you a number in a table because that wouldn't be the standard state for elemental nitrogen. But for N2 and O2, these are both diatomics. They're both gases in their standard states. And so both of these are going to have enthalpies of formation of zero by definition. And that's the one case where we expect you to remember that. So I don't have to give them to you in the table because you're supposed to know they have values of zero. And so in this case, we'll just do the water then, 2 times negative 242. That is all my products. And then I'll subtract out the sum of all my reactants. Again, nothing for O2, but one mole of N2H4 would be 95.4. And that'll be the crux of our whole calculation here. And once again, we'll pull out our handy-dandy calculator. So 2 times negative 242 minus 95.4. It's going to get us negative 579.4.
Now, one thing to be careful of here, so we didn't really have too much trouble with it here, but sometimes, because you're doing products minus reactants, some students forget to like distribute the negative sign through, or at least to sum everything in brackets first before subtracting it, or something like this. So, but we only really had one term on that reactant side in either case, but just be careful, that is the most common error students make in the calculation using these enthalpies of formation. Okay. So now we've used these enthalpies of formation. It's a simple plug and chug products, minus reactants and stuff like this. But the weird thing is, is we, we've, we've talked about that, you know, elements have enthalpies of formation of zero by definition, but I never actually gave you the definition of enthalpies of formation. And so question I usually ask my students in person is, do you need to know how something works to use it? So sometimes yes, sometimes no. So think about this. Any of you guys have eaten today? And when you ate today, you know, maybe you had a, a bagel this morning for breakfast and you stuck that bagel in your mouth and you're like, oh, as I stick that in my mouth, the salivary amylase in my saliva is starting to break the glycosidic linkages that hold the monosaccharides together, starting with the digestion. And then you begin to masticate. So, and then I swallow and peristalsis with the muscles lining my esophagus push the food down towards my stomach. So, and then it passes through a sphincter into my stomach and the hydrochloric acid, no, you don't think about any of this. You don't have to know how your digestive system works. You're just like bagel pie hole, bagel pie hole. And you can use your digestive system all day long without understanding exactly how it works. So it works the same way here. We just use our enthalpies of formation values, but we haven't even defined it yet. We just knew that we didn't have to define it. We had to just do products minus reactants, done. But now we're gonna take the step to go further and define it because it is a definition we, we want you to understand. But notice to use it, you don't have to define it. You don't have to know the definition or anything. To use it, it's just products minus reactants and you should really treat it like a, you know, just a plug and chug calculation. But you may get some questions that do require you to know the definition. All right, so we very specifically define these formation reactions and a formation reaction forms exactly one mole of a single product, whatever you're given the delta H of formation value of. And it forms it from reactants that are elements in their standard states. So let's see how this plays out. So like this value of 95.4 kilojoules, so for N2H4's delta H of formation value means that the formation reaction itself is gonna form exactly one mole of N2H4 gas. Okay, and it's gonna form it from elements in their standard states. So the reactants here, you can't have any compounds on the reactant side or it's not gonna be considered a formation reaction. And so in this case, our elements are gonna be N and H. So your reactants are only elements. And now if you take it a step further, those elements have to be in their standard states. Now again, your diatomics include both nitrogen and hydrogen. If you remember, never have fear of ice cold beer, never and have refer to nitrogen and hydrogen. So in that mnemonic. So, and in this case, they gotta be in the gaseous state as well. And then we balance. And so in this case, we just need one mole of N2, but we do need two moles of H2. And now this is balanced. And it turns out it is this reaction that has a delta H value of 95.4 kilojoules. So when they're giving you these delta H's of formation, it's really for an entire reaction that forms exactly one mole of whatever you're talking about from its individual elements that comprise it in their standard states. Cool. Now it turns out these are designed in just such a way that when you do the whole products minus reactants thing, what you're really doing is adding up these reactions or their reverse, you're minusing them for the reactants because that actually reverses the reaction, changes the sign like we saw with Hess's law. And you're adding these in such a way that you're really doing Hess's law without having to think about the fact that you're doing Hess's law. It's so much easier than your typical Hess's law problem. And we never even treat these like they're Hess's law. But the reason, the truth is this, is, this works exactly according to Hess's law without us having to think about a Hess's law. So whoever came up with this idea of enthalpies of formation and defined in this way, did us a huge favor because it is way easier to calculate delta H of reaction when provided with these enthalpies of formation. So now we can see why it is that an element in its standard state will have an enthalpy of formation of zero. So let's go back and take a look. We had in the last example that O2 had a formation value of zero and we can see why. So if we're gonna look at the delta H of formation for O2 gas, then we have to form exactly one mole of O2 gas. And we have to form it from the elements that make it up in their standard states. Well, the only element that makes up O2 is O and its standard state is O2 gas. And how much enthalpy is, you know, what's the change in enthalpy associated with having O2 gas stick around and just stay O2 gas? Well, nothing. And that's why the delta H 
a formation was zero by definition. So that's why any element in its standard state is gonna have a zero value by definition. Now notice if this had been O2 liquid, it wouldn't have been zero. If this had just been O gas instead of diatomic O2 gas, well then it wouldn't have been zero. But again, if you're trying to form an element in standard state from the same element in its standard state, nothing's happened and delta H is gonna be zero. Cool, now one of the common questions you're gonna get involving formation reactions now that we've decided to define them is not like use them in the context of calculating delta H and doing a plug and chub, uh, plug and chug type calculation, but it might just be identifying which of the following reactions in a multiple choice question is a formation reaction or which is not a formation reaction. And you very quickly just wanna kinda take the definition we've, we presented and use it to eliminate which ones are definitely not formation reactions. Let's take a look at a few examples. Okay, so now we're gonna go through these four examples and identify which, if any, are formation reactions. So first part of the definition of a formation reaction is a reaction is a formation reaction. It has to form exactly one mole of a single product. So good to go, good to go, good to go, not going to work. So this one right here, that's gonna make it so that the first example is definitely not a formation reaction. So that's usually the first thing I check. I look on the product side and I wanna make sure it's only forming one product and all these only formed one product, but then it has to only form one mole of that product. So we eliminate this first example that is not a formation reaction. Okay, second step is that your reactants have to be only elements. So then I look over here and I said elements, elements, compound. So this one's out. Elements, 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 elements. Okay, so so far so good. Got rid of the second one now, so two options left. And now those elements on the reactant side have to be in their standard states. If they're diatomic, you need to know those seven diatomics, things of a sort. And there's one tricky example worth knowing, and that's carbon. So it turns out that carbon has multiple different forms in the solid phase. And so just saying solid carbon is not specific enough. It turns out the common allotropes of carbon, there's carbon diamond, there's carbon graphite, and there's also a third type called Buckminster fullerene, which we're just definitely not gonna go with, but that would actually be a third allotrope. So when you have multiple versions of an element all in the same phase, we call those allotropes. And I just wanna take that time to introduce that vocab word, file that away. That's a great, just random chemistry trivia question. But you're supposed to know that it turns out graphite is more stable than diamond, and that actually is their determining factor in determining which one is the standard state. So graphite, it turns out, is a standard state. And so as a result, this third reaction here that uses diamond, solid diamond, instead of graphite, that's not the standard state, and that's not a formation reaction. But this last one totally satisfies all the criteria for being a formation reaction. It forms exactly one mole of a single product from indiv individual elements all in their standard states. Life is good. So that's kind of the approach for identifying formation reactions. Now, once again, when you're doing formation reactions, uh, most of the time you're getting a plug and chug type question of just products minus reactants, and you don't even really have to understand what the definition of a formation reaction is. But another place we feel free to quiz you is actually just giving you a bunch of reactions saying, which is a formation reaction? Now, if you found this lesson helpful, consider giving me a like and a share, a couple of the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you're looking for practice problems, I've got quizzes and chapter tests, or if you're looking for the study guide that went with this lesson, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.